Hello, and welcome to this live stream production from Cafe Lena, the historic listening room in Saratoga Springs, New York. Today's free stream is made possible by the generous support of the Sarah B. Folk Charitable Fund, as well as by the Adirondack Trust Company Community Fund, Kevin and Claudia Bright, Polly Set, and our virtuoso and lifetime members. You can watch past episodes of this series on youtube.com slash Cafe Lena. To learn more about our nonprofit venue and programs, please visit cafelena.org. Enjoy your front row seats for this event, live from Cafe Lena. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks to those of you who made it down for Art of the Community today. Really appreciate you being here um, for posterity as this video will live online for a long time to come. I'd like to record this as a snowy, dreary winter day in Saratoga Springs, New York. Um, so schools were closed and yet we persevere because that's what the impact sector is all about, right? Um, so I'm here with Bill Cole from a wonderful organization called Horns for Haiti. Um, this is part of a conversation series that highlights the work being done by nonprofit organizations based in Saratoga Springs and Saratoga County, New York. Um, this series is underwritten by the Adirondack Trust Company Community Fund, um, Bonaccio Construction, and it is uh, supported by our partner, the Saratoga uh, County Chamber of Commerce, which um, gets the word out and helps uh, convene nonprofits here on the last Tuesday of every month at four o'clock. And everybody who volunteers in a nonprofit who works on, in one, who serves on the board of directors, who's a donor, who wants to hear about uh, the work that's being done by the impact sector, come on down. It's a great way to meet people and to hear some stories. So uh, Bill, it's good to be here with you. Bill is, uh, um, we're neighbors really. We are. Right. Right downstairs. <laughs> we share this address of 47 Phyla Street. Um, and you have a woodwind shop downstairs, which is a kind of legendary establishment. And, um, and then at some point, you developed an organization called Horns for Haiti. Do you want to just give us a quick overview of what that organization is? Well, um, uh, basically, it came about after many years. Um, I, I started my relationship with... Um, with the people of Los Cohobos about 30 years ago when St. John's Episcopal Church would frequently um, bring their instruments over to my shop when it was on 19th Street at Waterville. So after many years of helping them out, um, it was always check the instrument over, throw a couple of reeds in, and, and uh, the good folks at St. John's would carry them down to Haiti to their sister parish in Los Cohobos. So that went on, and, and it came to be that... Um, uh, the mission coordinator visited me downstairs in my new shop um, in 2015 and mentioned that the instruments were in disrepair. So I had just mentioned back to her that I'll go down and I'll fix them, like kind of off the cuff. And she said, would you? <laughs> and so that's how that came to be. And then in the following year, in 2016, I went down for my first and only time, so I thought, um, to, to, to fix some instruments and while I was down there, I met uh, the music teacher, Maestro Markins, um, Mondra, Markins Andre, and he and six young men um, um, had workshops. And during that first week, um, I taught the six young men and the teacher, along with the translator, who made it all happen. It went so well, Sarah, that I decided I needed to go back again and again. And on the plane ride back to JFK, I, that's where I came up with Horns for Haiti, just as a little, little something to, to, to name, name it. Wow, Horns for Haiti. And so then um, as your shop moved around a little bit and you um, became established here uh, on Phyla Street, you did what? Did you start collecting instruments to bring down or what did you do? Well, um, af after I talked to a... 
um, St. John's about going down, well then uh, I started to collect uh, musical instrument repair supplies to mm -hmm. bring down because I just brought you know, a, a few duffel bags full of supplies. So after I taught them, they would have them. And then I brought down initially maybe um, 10 instruments. We had, we had lots of hands to carry them. So, um, so the next time I went down, um, I continued with those six students and then some. And so we just, every time I went down, I added more supplies, more instruments, and, and eventually the, the instruments became in better shape. And I mean, the first time I went down, I mean, I, I, I could not believe what I saw. Like, I got, went down there on my high horse and thought pretty, you know, about a bunch about myself for doing this. And when I got down there, I said, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. How am I going to help these people? They were in, in such a need of um, instruments and um, repairs, and and so it was, it was pretty daunting. But I became the student, and they became the teacher, as they told me, sh taught me how to about, all about resolve and patience, and and so it came to be. Mm. We we made great progress for every trip. So was. That the first time that you had taken on some kind of um, mission-based work like this, or had you been involved in kind of, you know, community service uh, at other points in your life? Is it part of your family culture? I mean, how, how did this come about? It came about um, on a need basis. I, I never did anything formally. For, for instance, there was St. Peter's Band at St. Patrick's Church in, in Troy. It was a ragtag bunch of little um, inner city kids that were wonderful. And Father Flanagan, it sounds like a movie now, Father <laughs> Flanagan would come over with his Irish brogue and say, would you fix some bills? And, um, and I never charged him that much. And then finally, I didn't charge him anything at all. Um, and that was my way of giving back. Now, I quite often, when I took on an apprentice, the apprentice would fix the instruments for these um, organi organizations and bands that didn't have a lot of money. And that was my way of training um, my apprentices. And they knew it, and they were happy about it. They knew I would check them over. And so that, so I kind of did it informally and uh, on the fly, but it, it, um, it always worked out well. Um, so I just want to get a little bit more of the feel of of what the project is in Haiti because I want people to be able to really kind of understand what it is that you're doing. So when you go down, you probably fly into Port-au-Prince. I do, yes. Which is a, a city, and what um, what's that like these days? Well, these days, I, d I only can see pictures on TV. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's bad, and gangs have taken over Port-au-Prince and the surrounding communities of Port-au-Prince where... Um, I know people people that live in those communities, and so they're they're having a rough time. So, from 2016 to 2019 was the last trip I, I went on. Five trips in all. Uh, it was always um, always a warning from the State Department. You had to be careful, and if you got into trouble, this was the number to call. And so it was a. We suggest you don't travel to Haiti at this time. Warning, basically a number three warning. When, when the gas prices went up and the protests started, uh, the people started to riot against um, calling for the resignation of the president. Well, then it got real bad, and the, and the State Department kicked it up to a number four, which is do not go to Haiti, and if you get into trouble, don't bother calling us because we can't help you. So that's obviously I, I could never I couldn't go again. That pretty much ended my my personal training of uh, music instrument repair. And so the pandemic kind of switched, switched things out a little bit between the pandemic and not being able to go down there because of the civil unrest. Um, I thought that was it. And funny thing, it was, a, we all know that what happened in March of 2020, <coughs> we, we all met our new pandemic here. And it sounded kind of like that, actually. Yes. That's what happened <coughs> in March of 2020. That, everything crashed, right? <laughs> And, and so um, the day I decided this is probably it f for Horns for Haiti, I had a good run. Mm. It's not so bad. At least I trained some people, and they will teach their sons and daughters and on and on. 
Um, with the day I decided that, I got a letter from the IRS approving my 501c3 or tax exempt organization. I said, okay, I get it. <laughs> I need to continue. And then days after, I received word from two of the original um, apprentices um, that they had started a business of repairing. And I said, well, that's what I'll do. Instead of tr going down, I'll support this business and these two young men from New York. And that's what we did. We started sending, we got a DHL account, started sending supplies down, instruments down. We still were able to support um, the Holy Spirit Church and school in Los Cajobos. And most recently, we started another business called the Haitian Music Instrument Supply Company, and where um, the dressmakers of Los Cajobos are making clarinet and sax swabs, and we're, and we're paying them $2 a swab um, wholesale, and 100% profit goes to them. And, and we're going to sell them as fundraisers. Excellent. So, so, so it's really starting to find its legs there. And Las Cahobas, tell, tell me a little bit about what that town is like. Las Cahobas, I, I love. Um, I, I really do. It's, it's 30 miles from Port-au-Prince. It takes two and a half an hour, two and a half hours to get there mm. because you sidewind up these mountains, these gorgeous mountains. And then the, it sits in a valley, well, actually a plateau in central Haiti. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you, you're walking up, for instance, the, the, the stairs to the music room has no railing, so you're walking up, and because the school is higher than the rest of the town, you're seeing uh, the, the tops of the, bu the buildings and the homes, and you see the mountains in the, in the distance, and it feels like you're walking on air. Mm -hmm. like you're, and it's, um, it's just a beautiful city that's bustling. It's very close to the Dominican Republic, so mm. it's, it's hustling and bustling. There's all kinds of music playing. From the, the time you wake up in the morning, you hear the roosters crow first, and then you hear the children starting to sing in the choirs in the churches. And there's three churches um, within hearing distance, so you, it's, it's just a, a wonderful experience, and I, I miss it. I hope I can go back someday. What would the weather be like down there today as opposed to what it's like in Saratoga? 90 and humid. <laughs> yeah. And, it seems and so music plays a big role in it, Haitian culture. It is huge in, in Haiti. Like you, all you hear is music yeah. all day long. If it isn't you know, from the churches, it's from the backs of motorcycles or um, in clubs. There's some clubs in, mm -hmm. in Las Cajobos that... At night, they kind of like compa, as they call it. You know, it's upbeat island music. And so, yeah, it's... It's it's, it's uh, stunning to me uh, that Haiti has held on to so much artistic culture, um, that that plays such a big role in Haiti, because if you think of, you know, if we were suddenly um, in Saratoga cast into the situation that people in Port-au-Prince are living with every day, um, would we still keep making music? Would we still keep dancing and making paintings? I don't know. Um, but We have. <laughs> Look at the pandemic. Being in the music business, I thought, that's it. It's, uh, I'm done repairing instruments uh, for the duration. And I wasn't. People were calling me, to, trying to reach me at my house. They're not getting, they don't have any gigs, but they didn't stop playing. They, they played at their homes. They played on, you know, through Zoom. They played on balconies. Musicians are the best people in the world. And they're all the same, no matter whether you're in Saratoga <laughs> Springs or in Los Hobos or Alcai, Haiti. They're all the same. They, they tell the same jokes. They have the same demeanor. <laughs> Um, I love musicians. That's great. Because they just keep going. So um, let me ask you this then, um, because I think that music is a key here. Uh, you've heard the, the expression or the piece of advice, be the change, be the change you want to see in the world. Um, how do you think that the work that you're doing supplying instruments to this small city in Haiti and helping them develop businesses uh, that can sustain them and their families. How do you think that that's contributing to the world that you want to live in? That's a hard question to answer because it's so minuscule what I do in comparison to what other people are doing. So I try not to overwhelm myself about the big picture, how, what's the change I can make. I just make it 
one person at a time, one instrument at a time, if we could put it that way. So you, I fix, say, I fix an instrument, or my son fixes a clarinet, you know, he, he's my right-hand man in all this. We fix a clarinet and send it down. We know that there's going to be a young musician that perhaps their life is going to be changed because now they have an instrument they can call their own and have expression, um, play in the church, play in the school, stay off the street because that's a big concern for the teachers and the, and the parish um, pastor right now is how many kids can we get off the street right now and into band programs? And so, so I'd like to think for every instrument we send down, perhaps we change somebody's life a little bit and if we do it one instrument at a time, that's okay because, you know, problems have happened one one problem at a time in these these situations. So, if we turn it around and do one good at a time, hopefully it'll add up. I think that that is what you're talking about right now is something that everybody who has sat on this stage in this series has had some of that same feeling. Here I am in this in this little town in upstate New York and. Um, I'm trying to house this person. I can't solve homelessness everywhere, but I'm trying to house this person. And I think that one thing all of us in the nonprofit sector try to keep in mind is the butterfly effect. You know, that butterfly's wing flaps yeah. and it moves air and that air moves other air and you don't know how far that's going to carry or what kind of effect it might yeah. have. But there's a ripple that's felt and the the child who learns to play the clarinet could become anyone. You never know. You never know. You know, and I've been in business long enough for 45 years plus where some of the children I've, I've, I've met many years ago are now in, in symphony orchestras, the Boston mm -hmm. Symphony, New York for a Philharmonic. And, you know, I, they would say, you rented me my first instrument. You know, <laughs> and so it makes you feel old, but it also makes you feel very good that you had something to do with it. And again, minuscule, their, their parents were the one that supported them. They're the ones who bought the, the instrument. They're the ones who repaired it for them. But I, I had a small part with it. It sure feels good. Yeah, it does. That's great. Um, with that said, um, you know, sometimes you do step back and I mean, particularly with a country that's um, as traumatized as Haiti has been. Um, and, you know, the shop gets started uh, in Las Cojobas and then uh, the gang activity gets too bad and for a while school shut down and they can't really run the shop and then they maybe get started again and it's up and down and up and down, but sometimes you step back and you think, you know, like you said, uh, it's been a good run. I've done what I can. I'm going to throw in the towel. How do you get inspired again? Like, let's say the phone doesn't ring and they don't say, hey, you just got approved for your nonprofit. <laughs> right. How do you how do you inspire yourself when you need to? I get inspired every day because there's, there's hardly a day that goes by where I don't have some correspondence with somebody from Haiti, whether it be a, a parish priest or one of the um, one of the shop owners and that inspires me because they're they're never a downer. They they don't complain. They're they they're always hopeful. They're always appreciative, and and that's contagious. And so instead of me trying to uplift their spirits, they uplift my spirits um, because of their attitude and their. I just think it's wonderful. They inspire me, and that inspires me to help them even more. They probably know that, you know, they're smart, you know, they're not going to, but, but, but still. But to have somebody in, you know, such a, so remote, you know, in this little town in upstate New York, caring enough to go out and raise money and find these instruments and send them and provide encouragement and really care about their success. I mean, I think that makes a difference. Yes, it does. You know, that somebody cares, of course, that's going to, that's going to really make them feel very, very well. Very good. Do you have any kind of, um, <clears throat> oh, I don't know, uh, you know, books that you go back to or songs that are in your head or things, uh, you know, quotes or things like that that are inspirational to you that encourage you in your work? Probably, the, I think the, um, the book that encouraged me the most was um, 
a book titled Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder. Um, uh, the clarinetist from the Springfield um, Symphony came into my shop downstairs once and he, and he said, have you ever heard, heard of the, um, Paul Farmer? He's a doctor that dedicates his life to people hating. No, I never heard of him. And, and he went up, up the street and he went to Lyra Ballack and bought that book for me um, days before I left for a trip for Haiti. He goes, read this. He says, he's from our town. You know, um, I think it's North Adams or something. Okay. Paul yeah. Farmer's from Western Massachusetts. And I read it and I became so inspired by his work. And it seemed so nonchalant about doing it at a time where um, there was, a, you know, dictators in Haiti and he, he overcame that and just went down anyhow. Um, it, it, Haiti was very dangerous at that time as well, and yet he started a he started um, a hospital quite near Las Cahobos, I believe, in a town called a town called Kanj. But that inspired me, and um, I've read that book a, a few times now. Mm. Unfortunately, um, Doctor Farmer passed away about a year ago, yeah. and he was doing some work in Uganda and and passed away, and and um, of course. Every, everyone is in, near and dear to him is devastated, but he left, he left a legacy for sure. I think that um, whether you're in healthcare or music or anything where you think that um, where you're trying to weigh whether or not it's worth it to make the effort to try and make a change, read the book Mountains Beyond Mountains because it really is truly one of the most inspiring books. Yes, that will give you a good sense. I mean, if you're trying to convince yourself not to work 24-7, don't read it. Yeah. <laughs> but if you don't mind going down that road, <laughs> read it. <laughs> well, he is one of, the, uh, one of the people in mind when I say when people do things that are so much bigger than what I can ever do, um, what I do is minuscule compared to what he does and what his co-conspirators um, do. <laughs> well, this organization he yes, created is phenomenal, it sure right? Is. And so you, though, um, are just kind of, I mean, you're not trying to build something on that scale, like um, Partners in Health, I think it's called. Is partners his in Health, yes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you're not trying to do that, but yet you have had to n navigate some some you know, challenges like how do I make this into a nonprofit organization so that I can go out and get donations and how I have to form a board of directors? How did you figure out how to do that kind of stuff? Um, trial and error. Um, what I would do is mo mostly, I mean, I had have, have a, I've already had a small business. So a lot of what I learned in that small business, I kind of transferred to the non for profit as far as budgeting time, money, mm -hmm. um, getting people to help. Um, and I, Sarah is on the board of Horns for Haiti, by the way. And, um, and she, <laughs> yeah, they <full> say, disclosure. <laughs> if you want to be, if you want to be successful, surround yourself with good people. That's I learned that early on in business and a good accountant, a good bookkeeper, a good board of directors. And boy, I, I, I nailed it. You know, I have some of my family members that are on that board, Mary Alice, who knows me the best, my wife is, is secretary. And, um, Mary also helped me pack for Haiti, by the way. <laughs> I, I mean, I pack all the important things like clothing, micro torches, solder, saxophone pads, and she puts in these little nice things like, um, you know, power bars and little yeah. flashlights, um, <laughs> international calling on my cell phone and maybe some malaria meds and passport, but, <laughs> um, I pack all the important things. So any, anyhow, I'm surrounded by some great people. I am certainly not doing this alone. My son, Billy, is next to me all the time repairing instruments, and he has come down at least one trip um, and, and taught alongside me. So yeah. basic small business skills translate to this nonprofit endeavor. And yes. then once you became a nonprofit, you were able to go out and start um, – trying to get some donations to help fund this project. And what would you say uh, is the reason that people donate to Horns for Haiti? What, what I see in their eyes is they hear about Haiti all the time. And when they see something that promising and a place that's so unpromising, they want to be a part of it. And they'll say, you're doing what? And you, you're accomplishing what? That's wonderful. How can I help? 
and they and it'll bring in instruments. Uh, they'll write out a check, and 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 so that's it, it's almost like it's it's a, it's its own sales person. Mm -hmm. um, I probably could do more to raise funds, and I, and I will in the future, but it's pretty much run itself um, up to up to now mm -hmm. with a few fundraising events. Cafe Guina has done a, a great fundraising event last summer. Um, Hattie's Next Door did a wonderful fundraising event, and we made enough money to send a brand new tuba down to the school um, and a bunch of material so that the ladies could start making swabs. So, you know, and yeah. this town is great. I mean, we have so much support from the people in this town. Um, I love them. <laughs> That's great. Um, is there a particular story from the last year or two that you feel like kind of captures the, the vibe of Horns for Haiti and what it is that you're doing? There's a lot of stories, but the one I'm most proud of is, is um, I mentioned that the two young men started a, a business of repairing instruments. They also teach instrument repair, so, they, so I'm very proud of them for that. But when they, when they started the business, I told them, you have to name the business now. You have something you'll be proud of, and, and you, know, you name your business, and so you'll, you'll get brand recognition after a while. Um, and so they named their shop, but they named it Shop Billy of Haiti. And I said, no, 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 you don't name it after me. And they said, no, no, professor, we didn't name it after you. We named it after your son. Because so moved were they that I taught my son, and my son was working for me. They, too, wanted to teach their son or daughter and continue this family business for generation after generation after generation is what they told me. Yeah. So I'm so proud of that, and I'm so proud of my son. That right there is an example of how one small action might persist for many, many years into the future and really change the course of that family. Talk about the ripple effect, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so you, you're you sort of bridging two worlds. You have one foot um, in the world of being a small business owner in Saratoga and then another foot in this kind of international nonprofit. Um, but as you encounter young people who are considering their path in life and you look at, you know, the richness that you've gotten out of these two sides of your life, um, do you have any... Uh, kind of reflections or advice that you would offer to a young person who's just not sure what direction to go in life? My advice with them to any young person would be get on that path. It might not go straight, but it might go off to the left or the right, but you'll be on that path and you're going to be amazed where it'll take you. It might take you to a place you never even dreamed of, but if you sit on the couch and do nothing, you're not going to ever get anywhere. If you have a dream, you go after it full guns. Um, and that's what I did when I was 19 years old. And, and that's after I got out of college. I was 17 years old when I went to college. People said to me, you're going to do what? Are you out of your mind? And I said, I want to learn how to fix instruments. And they said, I don't, nobody got it. Yeah. Um, my, my girlfriend at the time, Mary Alice, 15 years old, got it, and she, she encouraged <laughs> me. My music teacher encouraged me. Those two women in my life, they're, they're, the, they're the girls that really said, do it. If that's in your heart, you do it. And so I did. So that's the advice I pass on to them. Do it. Whatever your dream is, maybe it won't pan out and it'll go on to something else, but something will happen, I guarantee. Just keep in motion. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 15. <laughs> she was 15 years old. You guys have put in some time together. And, and it, it's, it doesn't seem that long. It, it really doesn't seem that long, for sure. <laughs> That's great. Do you have um, a, a, any other questions? Do, does anybody here have any questions? Or um, do you have any questions? Or uh, anything else that you'd like to add to this conversation before we power down the mics? We have one. Okay, let me just repeat the question so it picks up. Um, so uh, this listener said, what were the ladies making in Haiti? They were making clarinet and saxophone swabs. 
Well, basically what they are is a handkerchief with a string on it, and you pull it through the instrument. Um, I, when I buy them you know, wholesale, I, I sell them for around $13 for a plain cotton swab. We can, we can make them for between two. We make them for around $2. That's what we pay the ladies, and we're going to sell them for $5. And then um, when we get a brand name attached to it, we'll up the price and, um, and wholesale them to other distributors. But we're hoping to sell them to other not-for-profits in Haiti that have a band. In fact, every, everything I do in Haiti, I want to connect the dots. Um, Billy Shop is the repair shop. We have the school for teaching music. We have the ladies making swabs. We'll, we'll develop that, a product line in, in the Haitian music supplies where they can make maybe saxophone bags, carrying bags, whatever. We'll, and then we're going to connect all the not-for-profits we can. And so every business we connect is, will be sustainable. And that's the plan. Pardon me? Yes, all the sewing. We had sewing machines donated. We sent down, and, and that's what the ladies are using um, uh, to make the swabs. Yeah, great that's point. That's fabulous. So um, if somebody wanted to get involved, uh, make a donation, how would they find you? Well, um, they can um, email, email me um, through our website. Um, Horns for Haiti does not have a website right now and that's something I, I hope to change in the next year um, I'd like to find somebody who can web developers web, web developers develop, who may be any watching any suggestions right now. because now there's a big need for it I piggybacked it on my website coleswoodman.com and there's a page on there called Horns for Haiti of course and it has um, a brief description and how we got started and what we're doing and I try to keep that up to date but I think it's time to, to get a website um, we, we do have the ability uh, to take donations through PayPal. Um, and so if somebody wanted to contact me, I could tell them how they can do that or they can write a check to Horns for Haiti. And, um, and it is incorporated. It's a, its own its own entity. So we, we can take in checks or PayPal. And do um, you accept instrument donations or would you rather not? Um, I would consider instrument. We're getting pretty full right now yep. because um, I can only send out so many. Um, but if your church or organization is ever sending a container down to Haiti and you need instruments, I definitely call me because um, I'd like to reach out to them about placing these instruments. Mm. I talked to somebody this morning, a church in, um, in Port-au-Prince, and, uh, and we're, we're sending down 20 music stands to them. Right. And so we're always looking... For for people who can use the instruments, and we're always considering taking more instruments in. I'd hate to say no, but uh, you know, you never know that trombone will get somebody playing in the band. It's, it's, it's very exciting. I think we need to leave the conversation right there with the possibility of what a trombone can accomplish. That's right. <laughs> All right. So, Bill, thank you so much. Thanks for uh, your dedication to this project and for yeah. sharing a little bit about it today. My pleasure, and thank really you for what you do. All right. Yes. Great. These are